You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you've enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech and Finding Genius podcast. I have uh, Professor Paul Weiss. He's at the UCLA Microbiome Center. Uh, he holds a UC presidential chair. He's a distinguished professor of chemistry and biochemistry and material science and engineering at UCLA. So we're going to be talking about uh, microbiome related issues. And Paul, thank you for coming. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So uh, you have a lot of uh, background in the educational world. Uh, I'm sure your research over time has morphed and changed and you know, I guess skipping to close to the present or how, how long have you been interested in the microbiome space and what got you interested in it? Just a few years. So uh, we came into it in a couple of different ways. My lab is best known in nanoscience and nanotechnology, where we explore the ultimate limits of miniaturization. And in order to uh, do the measurements that we wanted of the smallest switches and motors in the world, we had to build a new set of microscopes that measured structure and function at the same time. But we also had to develop the ability to place chemical functionality where we wanted it from the submolecular scale all the way out to the centimeter scale. So that aspect of our work turned out to be useful for the microbiome because we were able to give chemical cues to the bugs you know, with which we are interacting. And also uh, because we had developed a, a series of sensors in collaboration with Professor Ian Andrews to measure chemical signaling molecules uh, in our collaboration with her, particularly for the brain, measuring chemical neurotransmitters. And in fact, the other uh, part of my uh, career has been developing uh, nanoscience and nanotechnology as a, as a field and looking at its impact both within the nanoscale and beyond. And so under the Obama administration, uh, I had uh, put together a team of uh, of scientists and engineers looking at what nano might do to impact the world. We developed the brain initiative uh, through that and, and laid out the technologies we would need to measure voltages and uh, chemical signals in the brain to understand how a neural circuit works. And that effort and our communication skills and bringing people in from other fields was viewed as valuable when the microbiome initiative was put together uh, largely by uh, Joe Handelsman, uh, then at the Office of Science Technology Policy. So we were mm -hmm. asked to lead the technology roadmap effort for the microbiome as we had done for the brain initiative. And so we gathered up uh, scientists and engineers from around the world uh, to look at how we might understand how uh, the uh, different uh, species and the different individuals interacted within the microbiome uh, within and on us in the air and the ocean uh, in the soil and so forth, and laid out what well, technologies um, we need to do that. <laughs> yeah, in terms of microscopy, it, it, from my interviews, I'm seeing that it's very important to be able to visualize things at the nano scale because of extracellular vesicles and you know cell to cell and bacterial communication. So at least in that particular area, um, is any of the stuff that you worked on made it uh, more apparent as as to you know what's going on in our microbiome and what kind of signaling is going on and you know, on the nano scale? Yes, yeah, so the microscopes we develop actually look at too small a scale uh, for the microbiome, but in a collaboration and a center funded by the Office of Naval Research, uh, we work with uh, Gerard Wong, who developed microscopies to follow the time history and generations 
of the electrogenic uh, bacteria, Schiavonella and Geobacter, uh, to understand how they interacted with surfaces, how they interacted with nutrients, how they interacted with each other, and how they changed over time. Uh, so using his uh, microscopes and a uh, combination of uh, his work and mathematicians we'd work with in understanding nanoscale images, we were able to track uh, what happened in those in those uh, biofilms, which are seen as potentially useful as energy sources. Oh, before we get into your specific research, any um, interesting insights you got from uh, looking at that research? You know, what kind of things are going on in biofilms, for instance, that yeah. are not known in general? Yes. So, well, there, there are a couple of things, you know, in order to understand uh understand biofilms, we need to think and measure in four dimensions. We want to see what's happening in terms of the, uh, the bacteria making up the films, but also look at how they interact in time. There's still a big controversy about how they uh, conduct electricity. Uh, and so we try to help resolve that. And it's one of those efforts that's I think uniquely suited to nanoscience and nanotechnology, where we've learned to communicate across fields. That's one of the one of the unanticipated uh, developments that really came from nano, is that since we evolved from chemistry, physics, engineering, medicine, toxicology, and so forth, we learned to adopt each other's approaches and adopt each other's problems, and it's why we've punched above our weight is probably the right way to put it uh, in terms of going after problems like the microbiome. So what's your specific research today about what are you looking to answer? We have a, a wide range of work in my group. I like a Tower Babel approach and that uh, looking at what problems we can take on in different fields. So we, we still look at the very smallest scales and how we can get molecules and assemblies to operate together an analogy to how biological systems work. We also do these measurements of the chemical signaling in the brain, still collaborating with uh, Professor Andrews. Uh, we look at high throughput gene editing, and we have a series of clinical collaborators here where we're trying to address the uh, diseases that are uh, single gene mutations like sickle cell and thalassemias and apply those same approaches to cancer immunotherapy. And uh, in addition to that, our our chemical cues and ability to place functionality turns out to be useful in, in tissue engineering. So at UCLA, we've hired a series of new faculty and we collaborate with many of them in order to uh, take on some of the challenges and, and look at what the clinical problems are uh, where we might be able to uh, have significant impact. One of the nice things here is science, engineering, and medicine are all around one courtyard. So we see each other a great deal uh, we're the largest UC campus by population and the smallest by area. And so that gives us an opportunity to work very closely together. Turns out we're also a friendly and collaborative place. And so uh, we've, we've, uh, we've taken advantage of, of that over the last 10 years that I've been here. So in terms of uh, chemical cues and adding functionality in tissue engineering, what, what projects have you worked on? Uh, one of the recent ones is developing periodontal membranes where when there's a, a surgery, there's a barrier that's put in place that's either Teflon and requires a second surgery to remove or collagen and just falls apart uh, with no, no real functionality. And so we're able to make a, a functional membrane uh, that's fairly easy to fabricate, that's antimicrobial on one side and anti-inflammatory and then also helps regrow bone on the other side, and we can control the degradation rate. So it really came from, there are four uh, clinical prosthodontists we worked with who said, you know, look, we have to, we have to buy this silly membrane and it requires an extra surgery or it isn't functional. Can we come up to something that, that, that's better? And so working together, we were able to, able to make that happen and, and uh, uh, put a team together that's now uh, advancing that uh, to the point where we hope to be able to get into the clinic in a in a fairly short time. So in terms of this periodontal membrane, what makes it, what, what kind of surface features can you disclose that it has mm -hmm. that makes it antibacterial? Oh. Like what, what do you know about how bacteria interact with, mm -hmm. you know, biosurfaces yeah. that, that excludes them? Yeah, so actually we're able to embed, we, we published uh, this last year in ACS Nano, the journal that I 
uh, that I edit. We're able to put uh, chemical cues into the membrane. We're able to uh, determine by how we fabricate it, how quickly it'll release and how quickly um, it will, it will uh, degrade on its own. And so all those uh, properties are tunable. And then we're able to show that we can, we can uh, recruit stem cells and help uh, regrow the bone. And now we're in the process of optimizing all those different aspects. And we'll look at what it is we need in particular clinical cases uh, in order to, to you know, deliver the right, uh, uh, the right signals at the right time. Yeah, that's great for the, the cells of the body. But what about the bacterial interactions with the membrane? How do you exclude them? What, what are they trying to do? You know, you can, the yeah, you can, you can prevent their growth. There will always be some, right? Your mouth is full of uh, two or 300 major species. And uh, we know uh, to a great extent what those are. We know which ones uh, cause damage and which ones are protective. Uh, another aspect of our work is actually taking the signals that they that they use to talk to one another and measure what's in place in the mouth. For instance, there are two common bacteria, one of which causes cavities and one of which uh, does not, and they're mutually exclusive. So if you know you have the one that uh, causes cavities, you want to you want to do something about that. Uh, likewise, there are some species that if you have an implant uh, put in your mouth, they'll chew around it and it'll fall out. And periodontists and prosthodontists know about this, but they don't currently have any way to do reconnaissance. And so what we're doing is developing the tools, do the measurements before surgery takes place to say, okay, well, if you have these you know, bacteria that are going to endanger the implant, hold off on the surgery, and then go ahead and and do the cleanup uh, before that takes place, and that should that should prevent a, a lot of uh, subsequent problems that a patient see now. And so, it, again, it's one of the nice things about having these uh, terrific colleagues close at hand is they can they can lay out unresolved problems for us. Sometimes they're you know difficult and refractory. Other times, they just haven't been addressed from the you know, from the right direction yet. And so we've put together this team of faculty, students, and staff who like uh, taking on challenges like that and who are curious and want to hear about other people's problems. And then sometimes we're able to come up with uh, solutions and go after those. That's that's really part of the fun of, of what we do every day. Oh, that's amazing. Um, uh, any other examples in the tissue engineering realm of what you've been able to uh, accomplish? Uh, we're still working in other areas. We have uh, a terrific group of people who work on bioadhesives, uh, replacing vasculature, uh, organs on a chip, and even interacting organs on chips, uh, trying to understand how uh, there are interactions between them and drug, you know, multi-drug interactions and so forth. For, for us, we're still poking around to see where we can uh, have some impact, but those, those groups are, you know, uh, those groups are nicely underway on their own. Well, what's your what's your unique uh, addition? You know, it sounds like you're good at bringing groups together and directing their research and all that. But I mean, you is is your role more of that, or are you literally, you know, deep in the research yourself in some sense? Both, I would say. So, you know, one of the advantages of having this journal is I get to see what everyone does. Uh, all around the world all the time. So I read and rate every manuscript that comes in. So I'm, I have awareness of the field and who can do what. Uh, beyond that, having our uh, colleagues and collaborators close at hand lets us in on what would change their practice if they're clinicians or what would change their field if they're scientists or engineers. And so we're, we, we've developed this conversation and an, an initiative associated with it, actually, uh, where we lay out what those what those challenges are and and see when it might be possible. And then I'm always happy to throw my body and brain at a problem. Uh, within my own group, I have people from chemistry, biochemistry, physics, math, uh, neuroscience, bioengineering, mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, uh, hematology, oncology, infectious disease, and so forth. And so. We have the ability to look at and, and describe a, a lot of these problems, even in-house, and then we welcome others to our discussions and group meetings and so, you know, large, so, larger get-togethers. So, uh, since you have an overview of you know 
many fields, what, what's coming for the layperson? What can they expect, let's say, in a clinical setting that will be here in the next, you know, five to 10 years that will help them in regards to a health problem? Yeah, well, I think there are a lot, I, I think there are going to be a lot of, uh, I won't say small, but uh, significant targeted improvements, I expect you know, that we're going to uh, use these connections to advantage where we say, okay, well, there are a significant number of patients, for instance, like that periodontal membrane, uh, they're very, uh, something like a third of adults will eventually have a periodontal disease or maybe even more in the U.S. Uh, and so if we can make their lives simpler and their clinicians uh, uh, practice uh, simpler and more effective, then then that's going to, uh, you know, that's going to move things forward. I think we're going to see a lot of those kinds of advances uh, for other diseases like the, you know, like uh, sickle cell and, and uh, thalassemias, where there are hundreds of thousands of patients a year. You, you know, if you've seen the news, you've seen that, you know, we have this possibility ultimately of uh, curing these patients. Our, particularly, our particular approach is to avoid uh, viruses and harsh chemical and physical treatments for the hemopoietic stem cells, so that number one they'll be uh, they'll survive better, but also so that we can treat a patient while they're still in the office. So instead of a sickle cell patient in the U.S. having a life expectancy of on the order of 40 years and reduced quality of life through transfusions, we hope in one session we'll be able to uh, treat and effectively cure them. Uh, in less de- in the less developed world, the situation is much worse. Life expectancy for a sickle cell patient in Africa is more like ten years, and so if we can take care of diseases like that, in that those, that's literally life changing uh, for uh, many hundreds of thousands of patients. Well, in terms of sickle cell, for a moment, what what some of the details of the solution? What are you able to reveal about uh, yeah. the intervention of the therapies? Well, uh, so. When uh, Dr. Steve Jonas came to our our group as a a clinical fellow, uh, we laid out some of the challenges that he faced. He's a pediatric hematology oncology clinician now. Uh, And uh, one was, could we come up with an effective way to treat uh, the hemopoietic stem cells that could be used to cure the disease? The target we set was a billion cells in an hour, which is what you'd need for a 12 kilogram child. And we said we want everything to be GMP compatible. In other words, it could be manufactured in a way that it could be used in the clinic. And we wanted to avoid the chemical and physical treatments that harm the stem cells and reduce their viability. And we wanted to avoid the viruses that are that are in uh, in use now because those have the possibility of uh, what's called insertional mutagenesis. In other words, they can give you a random DNA mutation that can cause some other some other uh, problem or some other cancer, uh, basically by where the uh, where the DNA went in. And so in uh, in the course of about a year, we came up with six different solutions. Uh, all of them worked within a week, which is very different than the way the rest of my lab works. There are some microscopes we've been working on for 30 years, and we're getting close, but they haven't they haven't worked yet. And it was a variety of different people who came up with the solutions. The you know one of the first ones was a mechanical engineer who had developed. Uh, fabrication technique for a completely different target for looking how little middle rings interacted uh, in terms of light and electrons. Uh, and the one that we're most excited about uh, currently uses acoustics, where we're able to get biomolecular packages that contain the gene editing machinery into cells uh, in, a, in a very efficient way and in a way that keeps the cells uh, alive and keeps their stem cell properties uh, intact. And so we're just revising a paper uh, on that subject and hopefully sending it uh, back into to a journal in the next couple of weeks. And I hope you'll see it very soon. The, uh, the patent application on that uh, project just was published in the last couple of days. So if people are interested, you know, they're, they're able to go read uh, something about uh, what we're trying to do. And we've generated, you know, we've generated a lot of interest at uh, UCLA and beyond. The, you know, the transplant surgeons here are very busy people. And when they started showing up in, in my office, then I knew we were onto something. 
Well, in the sickle cell uh, problem, are you trying to affect the existing hemopoietic stems or hemopoietic cells themselves and change their morphology, or are you looking at the bone marrow so the new ones that are generated will be of the right shape in that sickle? Well, it turns out you can take hemopoietic stem cells out of a patient, and then if you re-inject them, they'll go back and nest in the bone marrow. So you do have to ablate, ablate some of the bone marrow to make room for them, but they'll they'll naturally go back in and uh, then then hopefully continue serving for the rest of the uh, patient's life, uh, producing producing effective hemoglobin rather than the uh, the kind that uh, one gets from uh, the uh, the mutated uh, DMA. Oh, well, that's amazing. Okay, that makes, that explains the mechanism. Yeah, I mean, mm-hmm. again, one of the advantages of being here and having clinicians at hand is our our collaborators here have have worked on their diseases for years or even decades, and so they have the model cells, they have the animal models, they have the patient cells, and they have the patients. If we you know are are so fortunate as to get that far. And so we can tap into their expertise. We can look and see where they have bottlenecks. We can try and address those. And then we can build off their knowledge base and the skill set of their research groups and their uh, patient base to, you know, to make a serious headway. Uh, in most places, science and engineering are separated from medicine. And so you know, one can make some headway in the lab and publish a paper, but it doesn't easily go f- much further than that. You have to uh, you know, work out how to do uh, at a distance collaborations. And here I think is the, we have the combination of very high quality science and engineering, one of the top medical centers in the world. Uh, the top uh, clinicians are, are hospitals only a block away. It's the top one on the West Coast. Uh, the medical school is just a few meters from my office. And then our own group is even mixed between science engineers, MD, MD, PhD trainees, and 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 so forth. And so it, it's a really fertile atmosphere and environment uh, to be able to uh, make headway in this way. Yeah, that's amazing. So uh, are you open to talking about maybe one more, you know, thing that you're working on? Absolutely. You're yeah. What do you like? Yeah. 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 Okay. I mean, you pick which one really is like. Uh, well, I mean, even, you, the, even you, it's amazing you with all yeah. you see. Well, let's talk about the, the sensors. So uh, Ann Andrew, Professor Ann Andrews and I were at, uh, she started her career at National Institute of Mental Health and then came and joined the faculty at Penn State, uh, where I was uh, then also a professor. And she had this idea of measuring the chemical signals in the brain. And it took us, uh, let's see, 17 Six or 16, 17 years working together to make it work. And she was on that project, you know, three or four years before me. Uh, one of the one of the difficulties in all these cases is you have an idea and you don't have any data yet, it can be pretty hard to get support for it. So in the case of the the uh, chemical sensors for the brain, we took all the unrestricted funds we had from chairs and from when we moved together to UCLA. Uh, we used whatever resources we could patch together uh, to uh, make that work. We got a little money from the state of California uh, when the Brain Initiative got going. And it was really just as the, the entire package started to work together that she got one of these awards from the uh, director of the National Institutes of Health uh, that you know set that project in uh, in fast forward, and so I, I think that's been one of our recurring recurring themes is when you have an idea that's out there and you have no you know in my case I had no uh, no prior uh, track record in that field certainly in in medicine I had no no track record and when I came to UCLA how do you get these uh, ideas supported and and hopefully by showing successes uh, in a variety of different fields you get some credibility uh, and and ability to to move forward in in new places and new directions but it remains unclear whether that's going to happen or whether we'll just have to keep you know uh, sniffing around to see to see where we can get a little bit of support to get started well, very good um, again with your purview what um... Are there certain areas that uh, really are 
on a tear that are accelerating that are exploding you know what what are they for the uh, layperson what can they expect a lot of innovations well i think about it Right. On the medical side, I think the, the gene editing machinery is really changing, you know, changing uh, what our capabilities are in uh, terms of disease. And, you know, we have to figure out how to use that and how to safely and ethically, uh, as well as what the limits are of what we can do. And that's, you know, that's still being explored uh, in other areas like electronics. Uh, we have uh, new materials and new new capabilities uh, that we're developing that are hopefully going to make devices more uh, efficient, faster, and uh, more functional. It's amazing that, you know, nanoscience has been going for 30-something years now, and the field remains wide open. Uh, we have, you know, we've opened up more questions and more more possibilities uh, than we've, than we've uh, uh, you know, closed up projects. Well, very good. What's the best way for folks to <laughs> even begin to see all the uh, all the projects out there and all the research, you know, and, and then pick an interest of theirs and go deeper? Yeah. Well, the uh, National Nanotechnology Coordinating Office (NNCO) has a series where they try and lay out what different people in the field are doing. Uh, ACS Nano, uh, the journal that I organize. Uh, also tries to reach the public, and so you can get to that at acsnano.org. And our own work, uh, you can find at nano.ucla.edu. Okay, very good. Well, Paul, thank you for coming. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Look forward to hearing the podcast. You're listening to the Future Tech Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future technologies such as artificial intelligence, stem cells, 3D printing, gene editing, Bitcoin, blockchain, the microbiome, quantum computing, virtual reality, and exploring space are much closer than you might think. In fact, many early versions of these technologies are in play right now, and the companies that are using these technologies are the focus of this podcast. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a thorny medical problem. Remember, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and tell your friends about it. Thank you. Thank you.